Сонас е универзитетскиот професор и колумнист на Брисел Морнинг. Брисел Морнинг? Брасел Морнинг, јас. Брасел Морнинг. Ајде од почеток, извини. Брасел Морнинг, да, Брасел Морнинг. Професор во Кембриджи, колумнист во Брасел. Може да правете ти треба? А, не треба, да, управо си. Право си, извинете. Починям. Со мене е и професорот во Кембридж и колумнист на Брасилс Морнинг, Сен Ванкмин, со кого ке разговараме, со кого ке ги, спо... кој ке ги сподели со нас неговите размислувања за тоа што во моментов се случува и што може да очекуваме во наредниот период. Професоре, добро вечер. Добро дојдовте во студиото на Топ Тема. Thank you for having me. А, моето прво прашање е секако е кои се вашите очекувања, кога и како Израел ќе го врати ударот и ќе го нападне Иран и според вас кои ќе бидат целите? Рафинери, нуклеарни капацитети или пак нешто сосема друго? Израел must respond. Израел must respond because of the choice of weapons of Iran. Iran chose to send uh, 181 ballistic missiles, not cruise missiles, not drones, but ballistic missiles. Each ballistic missile usually carries about four to 500 kilos of, uh, of explosives. So had these ballistic missiles penetrated Israel, they would have destroyed a big part of the country. This is a kind of attack that Israel cannot ignore. However, when you look at the list of possible targets, Israel cannot effectively destroy the nuclear, uh, nuclear infrastructure of Iran because most of it is underground and built into mountains. Even bunker buster, bunker buster bombs cannot reach this depth and this protection of the rock formations. So attacking the nuclear sites would be pretty useless. Maybe it will buy Israel another few months. Within a year or two, Iran will have nuclear weapons because it is now assisted by Russia. Russia is trading nuclear technology against Iranian missiles. So I don't think they will attack the nuclear sites. Oil, oil refineries and so on. Most of the capacity of Iran is in an island, on an island called Haug. Israel can attack this island and decapitate totally decimate and destroy Iranians abil Iranian ability to distill oil and to sell it. That's possible. But th that will have a huge impact on the oil market in a time of elections in the United States. And above all, it will have a bad impact on the Iranian people. Mm -hmm. Israel's ally against the Ayatollahs is the Iranian people. The people of Iran, they hate the Ayatollahs. Ultimately, Israel will somehow team up with the Persian people, with the Iranian people, against the regime. If they destroy the oil facilities, these people will be damaged, the simple people. And of course, this is not what Israel wants. They don't want to turn the, the Iranian people to an enemy. What is left? N uh, military facilities, especially missile production facilities, military bases, uh, the military bases that protect the nuclear sites, and so on and so forth and cyber attacks. For example, cyber attacks against the banking system, cyber attacks against uh, water, water facilities, water distillation and so on facilities, against the electricity network, and so on and so forth. Cyber attacks could paralyze Iran for two, three, four days. The impact on people will be minimal. The message would be clear and terrifying. And I think both parties could calm down. So I think ultimately it will be combination military targets and cyber attack. Uh, дали Израел може да го порази Хезболах како што го направи тоа со Хамас и секако која ќе биде цената и дали сметате дека Израел ќе тргне да ги уништи Хамас и Хезболах по цена на директна војна, на директен судир со Иран? I would not agree that Israel defeated Хамас. I don't agree. I will... Го парализира, ше. It had some impact on the operational capacity of Hamas, but that's a temporary impact. 
I think in order to answer this question, we need to understand something. These are not armies that are fighting. These are nations. 70% uh, of the Israeli soldiers are civilians. They're reserves. They are civilians. They go to the army base, they get a uniform, they get an M16, and they become soldiers. Same with Hezbollah. About 90% of Hezbollah fighters, they are actually peasants and farmers in, the, in South Lebanon. These are civilian armies. Civilians are fighting civilians. And so we are talking about nations fighting to the death. Nations cannot defeat nations. You can defeat armies. You can defeat terrorist organizations. You cannot defeat nations. Nations are ahistorical entities. They survive throughout history in this way, that shape, that, you know. Additionally, Hamas and Hezbollah represent an ideology. This, yes. you can defeat the armies. You cannot defeat an ideology. And the ideology in the case of Hamas and Hezbollah is that the West is decadent, the West is corrupt, the West is at a weak point, at a decline, and this is the time to take back the Middle East from the former colonial powers and convert the Middle East into a, an Islamic caliphate or Islamic uh, region. Which kind of Islam is the debate? Because essentially there's no debate between Saudi Arabia and Iran that Westerners should leave the Middle East and it should become Muslim. There's no debate about this. The debate is, should it be Sunnah, Sunni, or should it be Shia? Iran thinks it should be Shia. Saudi Arabia thinks it should be Sunni. And then you have uh, Al-Qaeda, which was essentially a Saudi outfit. Then you have ISIS, which was essentially an Iraqi outfit. So the war is not with Israel. The war is between two Muslim blocs which are aiming for hegemony and domination of a region which now has Western presence, and they regard Israel as a colonial outpost, the last colonial outpost in the world, by the way, of the West. So if they eliminate American military power in the region, which they have, in Iraq, there are only 2,500 soldiers. No, no. And in Afghanistan, they're not soldiers. So they are succeeding. They're succeeding to drive America away from the region. Who is left? Israel. They need to get rid of Israel. And then the real wars will start. Интересно мислене за тоа и да се сега се наметнува прашањето со оглед да кажавте дека станува збор за војна помеѓу нации, не помеѓу војски, затоа што повеќето се цивили кои што се регрутираат или резервен состав. Но неизбежно е тоа сепак Израел има професионална армија сериозно обучена. Дали сметате дека постои шанса Израел да се прецени самиот себе во можностите што може да ги направи, а да ги подцени Хезболах и Иран? Израел е оверестимати Хезболах и оверестимати Иран. Дер е север проблем ве интелегенс евалуација на Израел. Израел е консистентно ронг во последните few years about the relative powers of its enemies. That's why Israel had October 7th, because they underestimated Hamas. So there is underestimation, overestimation, and overall there is no accurate perception of the strength, the direction, the goals, the philosophy, the ideology of the enemy. You should, we should make a difference between pinpointed operations, assassination, for example, where Israel is great, the best in the world. They're great at these pinpointed operations, but this is not intelligence. It relies on some field intelligence. Real intelligence is to read, read your enemy appropriately, evaluate the force of the enemy correctly, and then act proportionately. This is real intelligence. And in this, Israel has been a failure, not only recently, but since 1973, there is a major systemic failure in Israeli intelligence. Да, но доколку прашате официјален Израел, ќе ви кажа дека не, напротив, дека се. How would you explain October 7? How would you explain the fact that Israel allowed Hamas and allowed Hezbollah 
to become full-fledged armies next to the border. Моето прашање се надоврзува баш на тоа што го кажавте. Вчера или завчера из Белата куќа соопшти дека дали информација на на Израел утрото во во утрото пред нападот во средата на утро дека нападот е неминовен во наредните 24 часа а, сметате дека тоа беше максимумот што можеше Израел да се подготви зборувам како против авионска одбрана затоа што знаеле дека ќе биде напад нападот бил е или со дронови или со ракети it takes about 6 hours to oper operationalize a ballistic missile depends which type hypersonic ballistic missiles take longer but typical classical ballistic it takes about 6 hours so you move the ballistic missile to the launch on the launch you put it on the launcher etc et this takes about 6 hours and it takes about 12 minutes for the ballistic missile to cross from Iran to Israel 24 hours is very long absolutely very long and sufficient to prepare the defenses and everything Israel has four layers of defenses one of them is against drones and small missiles cruise missiles and so on and three layers against ballistic missiles and Israel is adding a fifth layer by the end of 2025, which will be a laser-based defense. The problem of Israel is not the preparation. Israel is well prepared. 24 hours is a huge <laughs> notice, it's more than sufficient. Problem is the cost. To, to destroy a single ballistic missile costs three to four million dollars. Every ballistic missile multiplied by 200, and you see that each round of Iranian attacks cost a billion dollars to, to defend against it, cost a billion dollars. Israel economy, Israeli economy is beginning to suffer massively, is beginning to almost collapse. Israel economy is in extremely bad shape. Moody's and S&P reduced the credit rating of Israel by two grades at, in the same time, at the same day. This has never been done before, not with Russia, not with Argentina. Not <laughs> There's never been a case where... Only with Israel. Only with Israel, the first time. Because they believe that the Israeli economy is about to collapse completely. If you take into account that Hezbollah has probably four to 600 precision missiles, the other missiles that they are bragging, that they have 150,000 missiles, that, that's nonsense. Most of it is small anti-tank missiles and... That's complete nonsense. The range is limited. For example, more than 100,000 of, of the missiles of Hezbollah have a range of 8 kilometers, which is nothing. But Hezbollah does have uh, 600, 400 to 600 precision missiles. Um, Iran has 10,000. Now imagine that Iran sends a an attack of 1,000 missiles. First of all, it will overwhelm the defenses of Israel and destroy a big part of the infrastructure and kill thousands of people. But even if there is a successful defense, it's going to cost something like $5 billion. And again, and again, and again. What Iran can do is actually destroy the Israeli economy, even if it doesn't kill a single individual and it doesn't destroy one house, it can destroy the Israeli economy. Uh, Со оглед дека э, официјален Тел Авив кажа дека се э, прецизно лоцирани барем пет места од каде што се пет локации од каде што се лансирани балистичките ракети кон нив. Зошто никој э, се уште еве па дури и вие не кажавте дека можна цел ќе бидат местата за лансирање. Yes. И сакам да ве прашам э, како мислите дека ќе биде рековте дека да нешто э, микс од сајбер напад и воен одговор. Дали војниот одговор ќе бидат ракети или пак ќе се користат најновата петата генерација на ловци со високо обучени пилоти кои што за разлика од претходниот напад ќе имаат сигурно поголем и попрецизен поголем импакт. No, you can't do it with the rockets. Even when Israel attacked in Yemen, they had to use uh, airplanes. What you do, you send teams of 3. There is a fighter jet with missiles, there is a refueling refueling airplane and a spy airplane, AWACS or something like that. They, so they move in threes. Israel, to destroy five sites in Iran, Israel needs to send between 60 to 70 airplanes, fighter jets, and another 50 to 60 mm -hmm. uh, refueling, uh, five to 10 refueling jets, uh, refueling airplanes, and about three spy planes. So about 100 airplanes. So what, what, it's a bigger operation. What Israel can do though, 
because Israel is equipped with F-35, which is a, a stealth, cannot be observed in, on radar, what Israel can do, it can stop, it can, it can refrain, it can not enter the airspace of Iran, avoiding the anti-aircraft of Iran, and it can send missiles from outside Iran into Iran. This they can do. Israel has this capacity. Iran has nothing. Iran's air force is 40 years old. Iran's anti-aircraft are useless because they are old Russian technology. Now Russia will upgrade Iran's anti-aircraft batteries, but it will take two years until 2026. Right now, Iran cannot defend against Israeli aircraft and has no air force, to, no, no air force that can cope. Iran has only one thing, missiles. It's the only thing Iran has. So Hezbollah Ilugi. and people. Hezbollah is a copy of Iran. The same strategy that Iran uses, Hezbollah uses, Hamas uses, Houthis use, they all use missiles. They all use drones because they don't have other assets. And missiles, missiles are very good against civilian population, but not very good against military installations. So Iran will lose should Israel decide to attack Iran seriously, should the United States allow Israel to attack Iran seriously, Iran doesn't stand a chance, absolutely no chance, although there will be damage to infrastructure and urban centers in Israel, of course. За край, мора да, за крај сакам да ви го поставам ова прашање. Дали сметате, да се вратиме на 7. октомври минатата година, дали сметате дека ударот, нападот на Хамас, ударот на Хамас беше насочен кон Израел, директно кон Израел, или беше насочен да се разбие, да се уништи таа можна соработка и сојузништво, што Израел беше на добар пат да го постигне со арабските земји во регионот? Која беше целта на, на Хамас? Throughout, uh, зборувам за сојузниство, no. зборувам сојузниство контра Иран, против Иран да. со арабските сосници. Again, uh, the real war is between Shia and Sunna. Not, Israel is irrelevant in this war. The real big war is between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Israel is a victim of this war, actually. But uh, what happened is there were very important processes happening, occurring. Saudi Arabia came closer to Israel, Abraham Accords in the last years of Trump. Israel was beginning to integrate in the region. Even Palestinians were talking, uh, moderate Palestinians, like the Palestinian Authority and so on. They were collaborating with Israel, talking to Israel and so on. It's not that the Palestinians were ignored. That's a common mistake of analysts. They say, ah, the Palestinians were ignored. They were not ignored. In the last year of Trump administration, they came up with a peace plan for Palestine. And they offered $5 billion support. And Palestinians were not ignored. Radical Palestinians, extremist Palestinians, Islamist Palestinians were ignored. That's a problem. The moderate Palestinians were not ignored at all. They were part of the plan of a regional alliance against Iran and with America. But the radical Islamist pro-Iranian Palestinians were sidelined and they didn't like it. They didn't have a seat at the table. Moderate Palestinians, Saudis, Israelis, Moroccans, Bahrain, everyone was at the table. America, everyone, even Russia to some extent was at the table. Even Syria, even Syria was beginning to. And only ones not at the table were Iran and its proxies. Hamas, Hezbollah, they were not at the table. They didn't like that. They wanted a seat at the table. And so it was not so much to disrupt the process. It was about being included in the process. Mm -hmm. In 2015, when, when the West signed the nuclear agreement with Iran, one of the main motivations of Iran was to be re-included in the community of nations, it was to come back to normal status. But when Trump abrogated the agreement, when he took America out of the agreement, again Iran, Iran became a, a pariah, again there were sanctions, again. Iran and its proxies were protesting against this exclusion, against this, against being ignored. And Iran pivoted and began to collaborate with Russia and with China because Russia went through the same process. The West was ignoring Russia. The West was excluding Russia. Even when the West was dealing with issues that they should have involved Russia, for example, Ukraine, for example, Syria, 
for example, Afghanistan, which is on the border of Russia. The West ignored Russia, did not talk to Russia, did not involve, did not consult, did not inform Russia. So when you ignore people, and definitely when you ignore nations, you're taking a big risk because they may hit back just for you to notice them. They wanted to be noticed. And I must say that if I, if you had a question, who won this war? Hamas. Hamas won this war, in my view. Because they succeeded in all their strategic goals. Tactically, Hamas was defeated, of course. But strategically, Hamas is super successful. Israel is hated around the world. Israeli economy is collapsing. Israel is at war on seven fronts. Iran, Hezbollah. Hamas accomplished. Libon, yes, yes the, uh, the alliance with Saudi Arabia is dead. America is criticizing Israel. It's not the alliance. Is not. All the strategic goals of Hamas were accomplished 100%. I za kraj, sa ugled deka vremeto ne isteklova, za kraj, kratko posledno prašanje. Smetate li deka izborite vo Amerika ima dvijanje na tehot na nastanite na bliski otisku? This is media, media hype. The media like to personalize events. Because if you talk about events in abstract way, no one is interested. Who will watch? But if you talk about Donald Trump, yeah, I mean, that's a personality. Znajte zašto? Zato što jednite se distancirat preko od Irak? If you look at the policies and strategies of the United States, the who is president is not relevant. Donald Trump imposed more sanctions on Russia than any other president in the history of the United States. Donald Trump initiated the peace accords between Israel and most Arab countries. Biden, when he came to power, continued all the policies of Donald Trump except immigration. He continued the policy against China, he continued the policy against Russia. Uh, United States uh, has continuity of policies and strategies that is completely independent of the, of the president, of who is president. It, it's a big ship. A single individual cannot change the course of this ship. It's too big. You know, it moves with momentum. Професоре, ви благодарам на вашето време. Thank благодарам you, што поделивте вашето размислување, што го споделивте вашето размислување и вашите ставови. Thank you. Со мене и со нашите гледачи. Ни се надевам дека што побрзо овој конфликт ќе се реши да може да That, разговараме definitely. и за definitely. подобри теми и поубави теми. Yeah. Уште еднаш ви благодарам многу. Thank you for having me. Кои се вашите очекувања кога и како Израел ќе го врати ударот и ќе го нападне Иран и според вас кои ќе бидат целите рафинери, нуклеарни капацитети или пак нешто сосема друго Израел must respond Israel must respond because of the choice of weapons of Iran Iran chose to send 181 ballistic missiles not cruise missiles not drones but ballistic missiles this is the kind of attack that Israel cannot ignore. However, when you look at the list of possible targets, Israel cannot effectively destroy the nuclear, uh, nuclear infrastructure of Iran because most of it is underground and built into mountains. Even bunker buster, bunker buster bombs cannot reach oil oil refineries and so on. Most of the capacity of Iran is in an island, on an island called Hag. Israel can attack this island and decapitate, totally decimate and destroy Iranian's abil Iranian ability to distill oil and to sell it. That's possible. But th that will have a huge impact on the oil market in a time of elections in the United States. And above all, it will have a bad impact on the Iranian people. Mm -hmm. Israel's ally against the Ayatollahs is the Iranian people. The people of Iran, they hate the Ayatollahs. What is left? N uh, military facilities, especially missile production facilities, military bases, uh, the military bases that protect the nuclear sites and so on and so forth, and cyber attacks. 
So I think ultimately it will be combination military targets and cyber attack. Дали сметате дека Израел ќе тргне да ги уништи Хамас и Хезболах по цена на директна војна, на директен судир со Иран? I think in order to answer this question we need to understand something. These are not armies that are fighting. Yes. These are nations. Uh, 70% of the Israeli soldiers are civilians. They are reserves. Same with Hezbollah. About 90% of Hezbollah fighters, they are actually peasants and farmers in, the, in South Lebanon. These are civilian armies. Civilians are fighting civilians. And so we are talking about nations fighting to the death. Nations cannot defeat nations. Additionally, Hamas and Hezbollah represent an ideology. This, you can defeat the armies, you cannot defeat an ideology. And the ideology in the case of Hamas and Hezbollah is that the West is decadent, the West is corrupt, the West is at a weak point, at a decline, and this is the time to take back the Middle East from the former colonial powers. Белата куќа сообшти дека дали информација на на Израел утрото во во утрото пред нападот во средата на утро дека нападот е неминовен во наредните 24 часа. Сметате дека тоа беше максимумот што можеше Израел да се подготви зборувам како против авионска одбрана затоа што знаеле дека ќе биде напад, нападот биде е или со дронови или со ракети. It takes about 6 hours to oper operationalize a ballistic missile and it takes about 12 minutes for the ballistic missile to cross from Iran to Israel. Israel. 24 hours is very long, absolutely very long and sufficient to prepare the defenses and everything. The problem of Israel is not the preparation. Israel is well prepared. 24 hours is a huge <laughs> notice, it's more than sufficient. Problem is the cost. To, to destroy a single ballistic missile costs three to four million dollars. Every ballistic missile multiplied by 200 and you see that each round of Iranian attacks cost a billion dollars to, to defend against it, cost a billion dollars. Israel economy, Israel economy is beginning to suffer massively, is beginning to almost collapse. Israel economy is in extremely bad shape. Дали сметате дека ударот, нападот на Хамас, ударот на Хамас беше насочен кон Израел, директно кон Израел, или беше насочен да се разбие, да се уништи Та можна со работка и со јузништво што Израел беше на добар пат да го постигне со арабските земји во регионот. The real war is between Shia and Sunnah. Not Israel is irrelevant in this war. The real big war is between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Israel is a victim of this war actually. But uh, what happened is there were very important processes happening, occurring. Saudi Arabia came closer to Israel. Abraham Accords in the last years of the drama. Yeah. Israel was beginning to integrate in the region. Even Palestinians were talking, uh, moderate Palestinians, like the Palestinian Authority and so on. They were collaborating with Israel, talking to Israel and so on. But the radical Islamist pro-Iranian Palestinians mm -hmm. were sidelined and they didn't like it. They didn't have a seat at the table. Moderate Palestinians, Saudis, Israelis, Moroccans, Bahrain, everyone was at the table. America, everyone, even Russia to some extent. And so it was not so much to disrupt the process, it was about being included in the process.